We have Michael Bassina here. I'll just I'll tell what people what you what what title you have, but I, I just want to also make a point out here that Australia has had an enforcement reaction to the FTX saga, and and that was quite interesting because they managed to balance a few things in that, and I, I, I come to you for that. Uh, Michael Bassina is the Piper Alderman Digital Asset Specialist and Blockchain Australia Chair, also somebody who has been uh, very, very um, uh, helpful to Coindesk to understand what's going on in, in Australia, which is always tough. Uh, so thanks so much for that, uh, Michael. Tell us about that. How is it that Australia handled the collapse of FTX? Well, thanks so much for having me on the show. I appreciate being here. Uh, look, the FTX was terrible all around the world and has impacted a great number of people and Australia is no different. So we've seen governments have a response. There's a, a view that something must be done. Uh, so in Australia, the FTX entities are in insolvency and uh, an administration appointment and it's working through that process. We've also seen a number of enforcement actions from our regulator, which is ASIC. Uh, and they have focused on entities which have had some kind of financial license. So they woke up basically when FTX happened. Well, I think there was a couple of enforcements, uh, one or two just before FTX, around um, some businesses which were trying to do uh, retail Bitcoin funds, mm -hmm. which was a little bit disappointing to see because many thought that the, the, those funds were um, in a compliant state. Um, unfortunately, they were too early on and, and folded without putting up any kind of fight. Mm -hmm. So I think that coupled with what's happening with the regulation and consultation moving forward in Australia as we start to see what might um, happen with the laws being changed, um, seeing that enforcement coming in, it's only a little bit, a handful of cases, but it certainly, I suppose, gives a little bit of guidance. But we always prefer guidance from Parliament than from regulators when it, when it comes from court. U.S. regulators have been really, well, have seemed to be really reactive to the FTX fallout. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening in, in Australia? Well, I think in many places around the world, the U.S. is seen as a, a guiding light in many ways for, for freedom, for even, transparency. Even when they're this slow to come up with crypto regulation? Well, look, everyone's been slow, unfortunately, but, but the US, I think it's been a bit of a disappointment to many to see how slow, and, and um, it's probably for due to a variety of reasons, including Congress being deadlocked. Uh, so we've had to look elsewhere in the UK and other Asian nations. Um, and that leadership, I think, is rising up in that area of the world, and certainly with MICA coming forward, which means that America is going to have to play catch up. And it's, it's a bit disappointing because we'd like to see America leading, but mm -hmm. it'll just take a few years, I think, before America manages to catch up there. Interesting you said that. Uh, Australian politics is interesting, to say the least. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've had a new government, uh, the Albanese government, uh, well, it was last year that they came in. Uh, and they said initially that we're going to bring in crypto regulation faster than the older uh, government. And then FTX happened, and then they said, wait, 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 we need to uh, figure out uh, things like token uh, tokens, and then they come up, came up with something uh, known as token mapping. Explain that to uh, the viewers for sure. Uh, so how does internal politics in Australia affect crypto regulation? Well, I think that uh, it's a really it's a complicated question to unpack. <laughs> but the movement towards regulation in Australia um, predated the change in government. We had a bipartisan Senate inquiry, mm. which, which um, went on for some time and came out with a bipartisan report with a number of recommendations, one of which was the token mapping. So that's been what has carried forward. And another recommendation was to move towards exchange licensing and custody rules. So Australia is looking quite positive and is consulting. It, while the token mapping was saying, we're going to look at there were various reports about it. It's going to look at every token and say what it is. Mm. It's not really come out that way. It's really moved towards what is a more sensitive direction, which is exchanges have been saying, please regulate us for some time. And that's coming through now and being heard. So I'm hopeful that we're going to end up with exchange licensing and custody licensing, mm. because those are the biggest areas that can have significant impacts. And when you look at the failures that have happened to date, having proper custody leads to good consumer outcomes yeah. in those unlikely collapses. There's a big discussion happening here in the United States when it comes to exchange tokens. How is Australia looking at exchange tokens? Uh, I don't think we've seen anything official yet. I think the focus has sensibly been on the activities where there are intermediaries, mm. where someone is in a position, if they're not doing things right, to abuse the trust placed in them by their customers and perhaps have situations where we've seen collapses and mishandling of people's assets. So uh, it may be quite positive to leave precise classifications of tokens to after the issue of centralized exchanges and that risk of custody are dealt with because that's where we can move the needle. Okay, all right. Uh, you talked about how with the US taking its time to be, well, to, polite. to, to be polite, <laughs> to land on a euphemism, uh, 
there are other parts of the world that are rising in this space, and particularly in the G20, where India is uh, currently the president, and they have said that the G20 is going to come up with a crypto regulatory framework for the rest of the world. The IMF and the FSE, the Financial Stability Board, are framing that for the G20. If Australia's position is about token mapping, however it might have changed, as you said, what is the contribution of Australia's government towards that conversation that the G20 and the IMF and the FSB are part of? I think Australia is quite aligned with it and will continue to be part of that conversation. I think that the G20 is going to be influenced very heavily by MICA. And really? I, I think it will. I think MICA has been well thought out. There's issues with it, but there's just been so much work put into it that creates a bit of momentum. And certainly the rules that have been put in place previously in Japan that were initially criticized by many as being too harsh, we saw in the FTX collapse. It, interesting you said Japan, but just for the yes. viewers, Japan is also uh, the president of the G7, and the G7 is equally important, obviously. That's right. So yeah, carry on. Yeah, Yeah. so we saw what we saw in Japan as a result of Mt. Gox, and this is just an oversimplification, but strict custody rules about exchanges keeping customer assets segregated and onshore in cold storage. Mm. And of course, in, in the collapse scenario, that's been a, a bright point of the FTX situation that Japan, Japanese customers have a clearer path to their assets being returned mm. much, much sooner. The US insolvency process is very lengthy and slow by design. Mm. Um, but I think that when you're dealing with something like blockchain technology and this globalized movement of value, you have to have those G20 aligned frameworks so that countries can come into a, a, a matching arrangement. Otherwise, it encourages further regulatory arbitrage. Mm. And that's not necessarily a good thing in the long term. So we've got to be playing the long game here, and it's got to be above politics. We cannot allow it to become as will it partisan. Be, will it be above politics? I would like to hope so. No, I think no, no. Will it be? <laughs> will it be? I think that people will learn from the American example and see that the partisanship that's here is not helpful mm. and watch the departure of businesses offshore and you're seeing the UK in particular and, and Singapore and other countries saying capture this industry. We want these jobs. We want this innovation. And that's really important. So the more that regulators and policymakers, certainly policymakers, wake up to that and say this is value we wish to keep. Mm. And the skew towards the younger demographic of crypto asset holdings is massive. Mm. So there's a demographic balance where legislators tend to skew towards a slightly older demographic mm. and the education gap is still an issue that has to be gap, um, covered over. Even years later, we've been talking about it for years, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Mm. So industry bodies like Blockchain Australia and the Blockchain Association and here in Texas, the Texas Blockchain Council are working really hard to try and get that bridge yeah. over the gap. Okay. We, we've talked a lot about the G20, the G7, these global regulatory frameworks. Do you actually think that countries can work together yeah. on crypto regulation? You, yeah. Like governments within one country can't even get it right. What I think often happens is someone gets it mostly right and other countries can be fast followers and right click save regulation and, and try and bring that in. So when it comes to law, everybody wants to look at what somebody else has done and has it worked and try and take the bits that are helpful and useful. Mm. So I think that's really handy. And even, even what Dubai has done with a, a year-long consultation of VARA, their new agency, before the rules have come in, is a really interesting model where the learnings and, and what's coming out of reports, they're saying this is what needs to happen. So mm. it's unusual to have an industry so keen to consult with government and find a way forward. Mm. And so for governments who take that engagement uh, and and bring it into the rules, it's helpful. Unfortunately, in America, you see that didn't happen, mm. and that's helped possibly inform where we are now. We've we got, we got to ask one final question. It's the most important question, your impression of consensus. Well, how has it been for you? Uh, I've been a veteran of many consensus, and wow. I feel like the vibe here is, is very positive. Coming in <laughs> when you're looking at a, a market where there's a lot of um, uh, you know, just concern around the regulatory position, mm. seeing people stand up and call out issues that need to be called out into the light so they can be dealt with. Okay. Um, is really, really useful. And the amount of building going on is fantastic. It's, uh, you know, the saying of people build in the winter and we see it all come through later yeah. is just, you know, f really impressive. The way that I don't think many people and many regulators and even businesses have understood how much money has gone into that open source development mm. and how much that turbocharges business more broadly, not just in the blockchain space, mm. when it can be harnessed. And I think that's slowly coming to light. And really the vibe I think has been fantastic here, notwithstanding the, the broader market conditions. Michael, thank you so much. That was Blockchain Australia Chair Michael Bassina.